The topic we're talking about here is genetic evidence for the catastrophic flood. I'm going to mention five different major scientific concepts. I say they're major because these are worldwide concepts. We're not talking about local uh, factors here. These are important worldwide factors that are significant and that favor an interpretation such as the, the Bible provides. We're facing uh, in the world a, a significant conflict here. One is, you know, science, no God, life evolved over billions of years. A lot of scientists believe in God, but they can't publish about it. Uh, the Bible says God created six days a few thousand years ago. A worldwide flood modified that creation. Uh, that's what the Bible says. And then you come to what most Christian churches believe in, and that is God created, but He used evolution over billions of years. Life developed gradually. And this is where, uh, if you want to take the Bible seriously, uh, the conflict uh, becomes uh, significant and the uh, rubber meets the road, as they say. When you look at uh, the geologic layers out there, this picture of the Grand Canyon here, uh, the question is, were these laid down during the Genesis flood? You have fossils through all that. Were these laid down during the Great Genesis flood? or were they laid down over the millions, indeed billions of years, uh, that are suggested for these uh, in the scientific literature. And this is, this is a big issue in terms of why you're here today as a memorial of creation. It's also a, a big issue as to whether you're going to believe the Bible seriously. A lot of people believe in God, you know, the atheists are, are fairly minor group, depending on different figures, 10% maybe at, as a good figure. Uh, but uh, most people believe in God. And they believe, yeah, that is, he, he did something and some other things are going to happen. But uh, if you're going to take the Bible seriously and if you're going to believe in the salvation it provides and uh, so on, uh, you see a conflict between the Bible and this. Because, uh, and this tells you a little bit about the conflict. Those layers that you saw out there can be represented by the left column you have here, the geodetic column. These are various major parts of it. And uh, in the middle column is the evolutionary interpretation. Uh, note that the uh, ages there are in millions of years and you go down to 4,600 million years and so on for uh, <coughs> the beginning of the Earth as according to the standard uh, geologic interpretation. And then you have the creation model. And that's uh, the column at the right. And uh, there, the figures are in thousands of years, not millions. Notice the great time difference between these two. And so the question is, you know, uh, which of these two models is correct? Uh, and this one, most of that geologic column, those layers that we you saw out there, would have been laid down during the flood. They're from organisms that were created by God, and it was after creation. The Bible describes this flood and a number of details and so on. And so we're asking the question, which is true? the evolution model followed by science and by I'd say many Christian churches or the flood followed by number of Christian churches smaller groups especially and the Adventist church probably the leader in promoting uh, 
a belief in the Bible itself. Uh, question comes up, uh, can't you put the two together? Not very well. There's a picture of fossils and the different layers out there and the different geologic layers. You have your uh, pictures and so on. Uh, and you have different kinds of organisms at different levels, fish dominating the bottom, uh, dinosaurs, uh, notorious in the middle part, uh, and so on. And if you say there are millions of years between these various layers, there's no way God created in six days. Now, the most direct words we have in the Bible from God are in the Ten Commandments. That's him speaking. He spoke it, he wrote it. And he says, keep my Sabbath because I did it in six days. And here you have, uh, you know, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. The Lord made the heavens and all that in them is rested on the seventh day. It would be a strange kind of God who would create over millions of years and then ask us to keep the Sabbath holy because he did it in six days. That would be very strange. That God's integrity and his most direct words aren't challenged here when you say, hey, there are millions of years out there in those layers. So it's, it's an issue of God's integrity. It's an issue of uh, authenticity of the Bible and significant uh, to those things that are meaningful in terms of not just this life but the life to come. Well, uh, first point I want to mention to you are extremely flat and widespread deposits. Uh, when you go out there and look at those deposits, they, they look incredibly widespread compared to normal deposits here. <coughs> this is during a flash flood one time uh, near Bryce Canyon, Utah, and uh, you know, materials carried out and so on. A little deposit was made in the, a lake from this, you know, and so on, but uh, these are minor deposits. The normal thing we see when we have our storms, our catastrophes, even our uh, major catastrophes, are small compared to the size of these formations that we see out there. And here, here's an example of uh, some of the geologic layers. This is in northern Utah. And we, we divide these layers into formations. And you have the names of the various formations there uh, for those various layers. And uh, the top one is Frontier, spread for 300,000 square miles. Spreads over uh, most of the state of Wyoming, and it's down here in Utah also. I mean, it has marine fossils in it, uh, so on, a lot of sand in it, and so on. The, the one below it is uh, Maori. That's the grayish layer you see across there. That's 250,000 square kilometers. Tremendously widespread. <coughs> One on top of the other. Then you got the decor, that's that little whitish layer you can see across the picture. That layer spreads for 815,000 square miles. I'll show you a map of it where it's distribution in just a minute. Um, Cedar Mountain's a little smaller, 130,000. And the Morrison, that's the famous uh, dinosaur bearing uh, layer, you see a dinosaur national monument and so on. Over a million square miles. Uh, here's a, uh, a map of uh, that Dakota formation I told you. That little thin white layer averages about 100 feet in thickness. You followed over all those states here in the western United States. I mean, we don't see anything like this going on now. It would take tremendous cheek and spread these layers out there. And they're very thin, continuous. Keep that in mind. This is, how did you get such thin, widespread layers spread over such wide area? 
And then we've got, uh, we mentioned the Dakota uh, Morrison, runs clear from New Mexico and Texas, clear on up into Canada. Uh, and these are unique layers. They lie flat one on top of the other. This is completely anomalous to the present topography of the Earth at present. Uh, another example here. <coughs> This is Capitol Reef National Monument. See that arrow? Points to a layer. You can follow it all the way across the, the picture here. Right through here, you can see it right here. Thin layer. That's called the Chenier Conglomerate. Uh, it's a coarse layer, coarse sand, sometimes large pebbles and it's sometimes even big blocks of Monkopi in it, rarely, and so on, but it spread over 100,000 square miles. Uh, th this is not what you, you expect from local activity. And again, it, about 100 feet thick. And here, here's this, it found in parts of six states. Uh, that little thin layer. Here's a picture of it. Uh, if this doesn't challenge you, you uh, I don't know what will. You see that green arrow at the left. Follow that green arrow, the little whitish layer, right at the end, tip of the arrow, you can find the whitish layer all the way through the picture. You see it? That's the Chenier. It's as I said, about 100 feet thick. Coarse material. How do you spread coarse material over all those states with normal activity? It sounds like a catastrophic activity. What do you expect, like uh, during the genesis of the flood type of thing? And just that little thin white layer there tells you a little bit about this. Uh, and you had to have a flat topography to lay it on. Uh, we'll get through that in just a minute. <coughs> and uh, uh, some of the scientists comment about this. There, there are a few comments in the, in the scientific literature that uh, fit into this. They're hard to find at times and so on, but occasionally the scientists come forth with a statement that uh, suggests this and so on. And he's talking here about uh, paraconformities. We'll mention that in just a minute. Uh, he says these layers, talking in the middle, they're strikingly unlike those that must have prevailed when Paleozoic and Mesozoic limestone seas spread over immense and incredibly flat areas of the world. And then he gives uh, four other references, four or five other references, I don't count them, uh, who, who feel that way also. I mean, incredibly flat areas of the world. Why are all those layers out there so flat? Why are they so widespread? That's not what's happening on the surface of the Earth right now. Uh, at least not on the continents. In the, in the oceans, yeah, you, you uh, abyssal plains in the ocean, you can have it. This is not ocean material at all. You can tell by the fossils, it's not ocean material. Uh, some of it is, some of it is, but uh, it's not ocean deposits. <coughs> And uh, here's a, another one, the Carlton Brett, uh, more recent, year 2000, in Paleos, made this statement. He says, beds may persist over areas of many hundreds of th to thousands of square kilometers precisely because they are the record of truly oversized events. That's what we're talking about. The accumulation of the permanent stratigraphic record in many cases involves processes that have not been or cannot be observed in modern environments. Oh, very interesting. Hey, modern environments don't fit what we have. <coughs> there are the extreme events with magnitudes so large and devastating that they have not and probably cannot be observed scientifically. He's admitting here that, hey, these things are really widespread out there. Uh, 
Then we have uh, some of these layers you can see right here. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon from uh, Point Imperial. <coughs> and uh, uh, you can see the red arrows. The bottom arrow points to, you see the whitish layer below the tip of the bottom arrow. That's a layer right there. That, it's called the Tapiz sandstone. That layer spreads around. You can follow it around uh, using the pointer here. You can follow it right here, around, down here. You see it right here. And then it's, it's up here also, right here. And you follow it all the way. This is all the same layer. A very thin, very widespread layer. This is in northern Arizona. You find it in central Arizona. We mentioned it in a couple of slides ahead. Uh, <coughs> One of the pioneers of uh, geologists. This is Dutton. Uh, second volume of uh, United States Geological Survey, monographs. Uh, this is a classic, of course. Uh, and here's what he, he, he says. The strata of each and every age were remarkably uniform over very large areas and were deposited very nearly horizontally. Just what we're talking about here. Very different than what you'd expect. Nowhere have we found thus far what we call local deposition and so on. Uh, that's true, uh, probably true at that time. There's a lot of local deposition you find, at least things that are interpreted as local deposition in these layers. But local deposition does not preclude a worldwide flood, an event that took a year. And you certainly expect a lot of deposition if you have flood waters moving around. So it's, it's not an argument for or against the flood. Uh, but Getting to the uh, Grand Canyon itself. Uh, we're so privileged to have the Grand Canyon so close by here. It's, it's such a prime example of the geology, uh, probably the best in the world. But anyway, look at the Grand Canyon. You have various layers there that you see. You've probably all been there and see the Kaibab, Toro Weep, Coconino, Hermit, Supai, Red Wall, Temple Butte, Moab, Bright Angel, Tapiz. That same layer I mentioned. Uh, few slides back. And uh, then the Precambrian. Now this is in the eastern part of the Grand Canyon. Go to the western part of the Grand Canyon. You've got the same layers. There's one slight modification on this in the Supai group uh, that we won't go into details here. But uh, in general, those layers are just the same ones, 100 miles to the uh, to the west, uh, and the uh, Kaibab, Toro Weep, Coconino, Hermit, Supai, Red Wall, Temple Butte, Grand Wash, that's uh, part of the uh, Muav layer below. Not, it's not in the eastern part of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and then the Bright Angel Shale. Uh, Tapiz, probably. Uh, this layer down here may be to pieces, I'm not sure, so I didn't put it there, but uh, it looks like it. Now, it's not just those layers, but for, you know, 100 miles, continuity, one layer flat on top of the other. Within those layers, you have continuity. For instance, you see the bracket the black bracket to the right there, uh, the one at the top, this bracket right here, that's the Supai group. Used to be a Supai formation, they call it group, Supai group now. <coughs> it has four different units. Those four different units you find throughout the Grand Canyon. So, not only are they unique as a group, as a group as a whole, Every one of these layers, over probably at least 15,000 square miles, was laid flat. Then another 15,000 square miles, another layer. Another 15,000 square miles, another layer on top. 
and another 15,000 on top of that. Then you get to the red wall, the bracket below it. Exactly the same situation. You have four divisions of the red wall. And some geologists come at, hey, it's the same order all the way through the Grand Canyon. Red wall is much more, uh, extends way beyond the Grand Canyon, so it covers most of northern Arizona. But uh, here in the Grand Canyon, at least, they find exactly the same four layers. So you, you spread out this red wall and then you gotta have another flat on top, you know. This is incredibly different than the present carved topography of our, our continents uh, right now and what we have here, uh, suggesting, you know, catastrophic activity. Uh, how do you explain this? Under normal deposits of a river here, a lake here, uh, some erosion here, and all this stuff. No, these are continuous layers, extremely thin, extremely widespread, extremely flat conditions under which they were laid down. You'd expect this during a flood as the flood waters brought in one layer on top of the other. Well, uh, these are just the names of those uh, various divisions uh, which are not significant in, in terms of our argumentation here. But uh, <coughs> get a little further down in the layers of the Grand Canyon, <coughs> you have the Tano group, uh, which are these three layers, the Muav, the Bright Angel, and the Tapis. Uh, the most comprehensive study on this uh, was done by a McKeon Resser, 1945. It's still the classic on this thing. Uh, some details have been studied, but nothing covering the group, the group as a whole. And within within the well, in the middle layer, back up here just a second, even that bright, the Muav. See that, that whitish layer there, the Muav. Within uh, Within that layer, uh, they find markers, markers that extend uh, for quite a while. Now, it's thin layers that you can say, hey, this, uh, like I can follow this, I can follow this, so on. And these thin layers. And some examples uh, from that publication. It is a fine, even grained, reddish gray sandstone, only a few feet thick, which extends from Grand Wash Cliffs eastward, eastward at least 35 miles to the vicinity of Granite Park. Here's this little thin layer, a few feet thick, they can follow for 35 miles. Totally anomalous to present deposition. Uh, again, go there. Proposed 17 widespread key markers in the Moav, spreading from 30 to 95 miles. I mean, Again, uh, compares to nothing that we see going on at present on the continents. Uh, we might have it in the abyssal plains of the sea. Second point, period topography does not match present topography. Topography, we think that refers to the surface of the, uh, of the earth, uh, ups and downs and so on that you have there. Uh, it's different. The paleo-topography is different than the present. Uh, look here. Look at those layers out there. You see how flat they are? All over the place here, the granite, that's the Colorado River there that you see. Uh, look how flat those layers are compared to the carved present topography. Uh, Grand Canyon, uh, I mean, uh, the Colorado River, no doubt, uh, having contributed to that. Uh, in the uh, geomorphology textbook, geomorphology refers to the shape of geological features. Uh, here it says, the Earth topography is older than tertiary. Th this is a tremendously interesting statement to make. Little of Earth topography is older than tertiary. 
where are our ancient Mount Everest and Grand Canyons in these old layers? Why is it all recent stuff that we have at present? Our topography, the ups and downs, are recent. The old layers are flat, as you'd expect for a worldwide flood. We can tell how we are disturbed by <coughs> has occurred when the juggler's by noting the disturbances concentrate in the top layers. Uh, he says at the top there, older than Pleistocene, a uh, little older, and so on. What does that mean? This is the uh, geologic column names of those layers that they're using there. And uh, to the right up here, this part, you can see, he says, little of Earth's topography is older than Pleistocene. And that's the second one down, that list right there. Uh, these are the assumed ages that they apply to, the, to these things and so on. But you go down here and so on, these others, uh, these all tend to be flat, 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 flat. Most of you, he says, little is, uh, is older and tertiary. Uh, another reference talks about uh, Little Earth topography is older than 15 million years. Well, then you know this would put it uh, right up here in, in the Pliocene, Pleistocene, uh, somewhere right in here, uh, above the Miocene and so on. Uh, it, it's an interesting thing. You look at those old layers, they're flat. You look at the present surface of the earth, it's been carved. Why didn't we have that carving in the past? As I said, you know, where are the old Mount Everest? Where are the old Grand Canyons? Well, uh, paleo environments. There's no way you could spread the extremely widespread relatively thin Paleozoic, Mesozoic formations. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, these are the lower ones we're referring to. <clears throat> Over the present and carved topography of most of our continents, you need a flat topography for many formations. Not only are these layers flat, you gotta have something flat to lay it on. Or it's not gonna be continuous as a thin layer. They don't go around Mount Everest. They don't go around Grand Canyon, the fallen Grand Canyon. So they're continuous. Oh, some exceptions. Uh, Shinarip has a, a little pocket once that, that's not continuous. But most of it is continuous. Uh, so if you look at these paint environments, they're too flat, they're too thin, they're too widespread, they're too many to reconcile concurrent continental topography. They fetch much better with the expectations of a worldwide flood. Three, rates of erosion challenge at standard geologic time scale. Uh, you know, we see all of these figures all the time. Well, this is the millions of years, the billions of years here, and so on. Uh, go to our national parks and you see a lot of this. Uh, rates of erosion challenge those long ages. Why? They're way too fast to fit into those long ages. Uh, our continents are being eroded away. You know, rivers carry sediments to the ocean and so on. And it uh, turns out that the rivers, that rivers are carrying sediments to the ocean, our continents could have been eroded many, many times, likely a hundred, several hundred times if they are as old as generally suggested. Why are our continents still here if uh, they're as old as they claim they are? Now, erosion is, is uh, uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, it, it challenges the geology of the center of the time scale. 
Uh, it's quite easy to measure. Uh, all you do is to measure the material coming from the sediment from the rivers. This is an island. You see uh, rivers in blue there. They carry sediment. You measure the sediment coming out at the mouth of the rivers, and you can tell how fast that continent is being eroded. And this has been done, lots of studies have done this, especially in, in the mid-50s and 60s, 70s of the last century, uh, for this. And what did they find? They find, hey, it's going awful fast. Uh, here's a dozen references. Gives you a million metric tons per year. Average is about 25 million. I mean 25,000 uh, million metric tons. And you can convert that to uh, the thickness of the sediment layers and so on. And you turn up with uh, figures that our continents average 623 meters in elevation. Hence, uh, an average rate of erosion of 61 millimeters per thousand years, which is what that turns out to be. Uh, and that's uh, only six hundredths of a millimeter per year if you want to get into uh, uh, time you're used to thinking about. Uh, still, it's tremendously fast when you start talking about millions and billions of years. Uh, and so on. Uh, we could erode the continents down to ten million years and a billion years. Uh, you could erode them 100 times. Of course, you can erode them only once. Um, then you don't have anything left to erode. Uh, but, uh, Totten Bay and their book, Evolution of the Earth, uh, attested to that. This, this was recognized uh, in the middle of the last century, it was recognized, and it was kind of a buzz in the geologic literature for a while, but uh, it's not considered now. But well, you know, they go from one topic to another. They're mostly interested in looking for oil and coal and so on. But uh, here's a comment made. North America is being denuded at a rate that could level it in a mere 10 million years. Or to put it another way, at the same rate, 10 North Americas could have been eroded since Middle Cretaceous time 100 million years ago. If we next assume the present rate of erosion, exposed continent volumes to have been constant over, say, the past one billion years, then we would expect a staggering 30,000 meters thick layer of sediments to cover the sea floors. Apparently, we have you know, <coughs> error badly in making our assumptions. Uh, you have about 3,000 meters of, of sediment in the ocean, uh, so it's uh, about 1,000 feet factor of a thousand off on that. Uh, some of it is assumed to have gone in by subduction and so on. But that's another topic we won't go into at this time. But it's recognized in the literature in several places. Uh, hey, it's, it's way too fast. Nevertheless, uh, the current paradigm of long ages uh, prevails. And these calculations need to be kept in mind that man's activities, especially uh, agriculture have increased at the rate of erosion, have increased the rate of erosion. Hence, that rate was slower in the past. It is estimated that at present erosion is 1.5 times faster what, what it was before because of agriculture. And so you, you need to cut uh, your present figures a little bit, but not very much. And, it, and it, you can't get the uh, is still there. And uh, when we say all the continents have been 100 to 150 times, uh, you could come up with figures 200, 250 times easily uh, if you use present rates uh, that those continents should have been eroded away. Uh, so it's a real challenge. Uh, but one that's not considered, well, I, I might say, uh, some geologists say, no, we are not present in a very active geological time. All 
by present. Things are much faster than they were in the past, and so on, which is the contrary of what you'd expect uh, from uh, the Earth forming and cooling and so on and settling down uh, and becoming a, uh, more or less in a state of equilibrium. Uh, but uh, so there's a little bit of attention to it, but not very much. Now, one point we might mention uh, in textbook that we, they'll say, you know, well, how come our mountain ranges are still here? And the standard answer is that they have been renewed from below. That is a very unrealistic suggestion. As we examine the continents, we find rocks assumed to be very old to very young. The whole GI column is still there, very well represented. We have not gone through even one complete cycle of erosion. The whole thing is still there. You haven't done it once. And it should have disappeared at least 100 times. It doesn't look like those long ages are there. And these rates of erosion are important and with, this, with this argument here. And that is the flat gaps, the periconformities. They challenge the long geologic ages also in a more specific way. <coughs> when you look at these layers like this is a dead horse point in Utah. Uh, what you don't realize is that major parts of the geologic column are missing between these various layers. Uh, you got you got a gap of 10 million years there. In 10 million years, you'd expect you know at least a thousand feet of erosion. Uh, maybe 2,000. Uh, you've got another gap there of 20 million years. Right? You'd expect erosion just as deep as that hole, that, that scarp there you see over there is about 2,000 feet high. You'd expect that's how deep the erosion would be according to the average figures for the world, according to these studies that we showed you, a dozen studies and so on. Uh, why? Isn't there erosion at these gaps where these parts of the column are missing? They tell they're missing because at other places they, they find the layers that fill in between. Well, uh, the 10 million year gap is right there. That is the Chenerp conglomerate. You remember that one? We told you about uh, earlier that was uh, so flat and widespread. It's that little thin layer you see right at the end of that red arrow. Follow it all the way through there. 10 million years. It's supposed to be right below that, between that and the, the, the darker layer. Uh, it's really, it's not darker in this picture, but it was in the morning cookie. 10 million years. Look how flat that is. It's a very flat layer, no time for topography to develop. It's a very flat layer, then on top of another very flat layer. Where's that 10 million years? Let's try another one. That's the 20 million year one. It's that whitish layer, you can follow it all through the picture here, the white ridge there. Uh, 20 million years. Again, very flat layer. It sat there for 20 million years, and then the next layer could be laid on very flat on top of it. Uh, this is a major gap that you find in widespread in the western United States, that, that 20 million year one. Here's the, here's the, uh, the issue. You lay layers down, one on top of the other, they'll be flat, as in figure A on top. Now supposing you have a gap. Gap, you have no deposition, the layers are put up, so on, rain comes down, rivers pour and so on and you have erosion, you have your typical topography developing. So you see B shows you the irregular topography. C, you start laying down layers over that irregular topography. You should be able to follow that irregular topography uh, because the layers aren't flat. And I'll point it out right here. You see, this is the same topography as you had in B. Up there, you see it right here. 
So you'd expect this. And then you go through another cycle again, where you have erosion and deposition, and you're going to end up with topography that looks like this. This is now what we see out there. Those gaps don't reflect the erosion that you'd expect during that time. We're talking about a different game here than what's going on at present in terms of erosion and irregular topography. What we see is, is right here, for instance, where the layers are kind of flat on top of each other. Uh, and here are some layers that are, aren't represented here. And so if you say there's 20 million years between for these two layers, you expect 20, 20 million years worth of erosion there. And in 20 million years, you know, you, you'd expect oh, uh, at least 2,000 feet of erosion. And erosion isn't flat, except some, some uh, geologists have tried to suggest that. And we can't discuss that point, but we can discuss it later on if you want to. So uh, uh, here's the Grand Canyon. <coughs> uh, there's a six meter gap in the Grand Canyon. You'd expect some 600 feet of erosion there. There's a 14 meter gap in the Grand Canyon. And you'd, you'd expect, you know, about 1,400 feet of erosion. Uh, and then there's a 100 million year gap in the Grand Canyon. And you'd expect two miles of erosion. And the canyon's only a mile deep. How are you going to reconcile our measured erosion rates with the geodonic time? So we've got here uh, a paradox. So now you want to know where those gaps are? This is the six million year one. This is the 14 million year one. And this is the 100 million year one. All over the Grand Canyon. Notice how flat those layers are, 100 million years. Ah. Uh, if anything should convince you that the picture in the past is very different, it's this diagram. This is those same layers, except where there are gaps, I have put in black according to the amount of time. In other words, the whitish layers you see there, they lie flat on top, one on top of the other. Actually, they lie just right flat on top of the other. You don't see the gaps. You didn't see them in the last picture, you know. You can see them. To, to the, but this is the standard geological time interpretation for these layers. This is an area just northeast of the Grand Canyon. It has some of the same layers of the Grand Canyon. Uh, for instance, you see the tapetes down here that we've talked about uh, in the bottom, and so on. Uh, the the uh, chenarp we've been talking about uh, is right in the bottom of this layer right there. There's that gap we've been talking about, that 10 million year gap, and so on. Uh, the 14 million year gap we we're talking is involved in here. Uh, this is the top of the Grand Canyon right here, and so on. These are layers above it. And, and so on. Notice how flat these various contacts are compared to the present topography. The present topography of that region is illustrated in two lines. Here one's dotted, the other one is flat, is uh, continuous. Uh, this, this line right here, the dotted line, is right along Interstate 70. In that region, this uh, continuous line here is just a little bit south of there. Notice how irregular the topography is. The paleo topography is very different than the present topography, just as you'd expect uh, for a flood interpretation. Some of the specialists in the Grand Canyon talk about these gaps. Uh, this is a, 
a classic on uh, the Grand Canyon uh, <coughs> by leaders of the uh, students of the Grand Canyon geology. Uh, Blakey says, contrary to the implications of McKee's work, the location of the boundary between the Mayakasha and Oskogemi formations, that's where that 14 million year gap is. It's in that Supai group that we mentioned earlier. <coughs> excuse me, can be difficult to determine, both from a distance and from close range. Hey, you got a 14 meter gap here and you can't even find it in places. Um, use here, uh, the, so in referring to some localities of the very long lower gap states, here are the inconformity, the gaps, or paraconformity is a name for them, uh, even though representing more than a hundred million years may be difficult to locate. Going on, <clears throat> so you know, some places they can't even see. Let me show you an example here. Uh, these are the layers of the Grand Canyon. This is not the Grand Canyon, it's just the edge of the Grand Canyon, it's the Grand Wash Cliffs. It's the end of the Grand Canyon Plateau. It's the same layers of the Grand Canyon. Uh, well, in fact, uh, <coughs> the Grand Canyon, uh, uh, Colorado River comes out just a little bit to the left of this picture here. You see the black arrow? See the whitish layer across there? That is the Moab. The darker layer above it is the Temple Butte. Moab is Cambrian, Temple Butte is Devonian. That is that 100 million year gap. Notice how flat it is? 100 million years, no erosion. This must have been laid down rapidly during the flood. <coughs> you want to see a little closer, that contact? There it is right there. Here's the Moab. Below the arrow, <coughs> Temple Butte above the arrow. 100 million years, rock doesn't seem even weathered. If you want to know what we're talking about here, here's the uh, Moab, right here, Cambrian. Temple Butte's Ordovician. Uh, Temple Butte is Devonian, sorry. The Silurian and Ordovician are missing. You have Devonian sitting on top of the Cambrian. Silurian and Ordovician are missing there. That's 100 million years. And the contact looks very flat, as we've shown you in several places. Uh, this is a contact between uh, Shinarip in the Moenkopi in Capitol Reef. And uh, the Shinarip is the whitish rock above it, and the Moenkopi is this muddy stuff below. And it's um, apparently it was very soft when it was contacted. It's not hard rock. But there's 10 million years difference between. The Shinarip, which is pointed out by the red arrows, and the Moenkopi, which is pointed out by the green arrows. And stuff must have been soft, as you'd expect during a flood. And you, there, there are experiments. You can do experiments in the laboratory where you shake sandstone over mud and so on. It'll drop down these things we call pillows. Uh, those, those red, uh, uh, this red arrow here, this represents a pillow here, or they call a pillow. Uh, type of thing. It, it came down, but it happens in soft mud. It happens during earthquakes. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Geomorphology uh, comment here. The geologic record of sedimentary rocks is full of unconformities. That's those gaps I've been telling you about. Major gaps. Uh, they're called paraconformities also. Uh, under certain conditions. Unconformity is a broader term for a, a paraconformity. 
<coughs> that represent long periods of emergence and erosion of continent-sized regions. These uncomfortable are commonly nearly planar. They're all over the place there. Full of them. And they're flat. That's where you have these gaps, and they're flat. That's not what you'd expect over long ages. Um, then he goes on to say, it would be appropriate to describe a modern peneplain. Peneplain is, some have suggested, well, you know, if, if they, let, let them flatten out when you get down to sea level, so on, you're going to have a baseline, and you're going to get these flat things. That's one model. Uh, we don't have time to go into that thing. I'd be glad to discuss it later. Uh, it's, it's been classified as a parlor game uh, by some geologists. But anyway, it, it was, it, it's what a peneplain is. So it would be appropriate to describe a modern peneplain as a conclusion of this section, but unfortunately none are known. If these things are so common over the earth, why don't we have an example now? Now, there are some small examples, you know, nothing like the great big ones that we see uh, common to the, to the geological record. Well, uh, <coughs> another comment here. The origin of paraconformities, uh, those gaps, is uncertain. I certainly don't have a simple solution to this problem. Uh, I knew a very uh, honored uh, geologist. Uh, okay, concludes my parent. Because paraconformities are so abundant over the Earth, they represent an important component for the interpretation of Earth history. Paraconformities pose a serious challenge to the standard geologic time scale, radiometric dating, and interpretations of extended time for the development of life on Earth. Paraconformities are what you would expect from the rapid deposition sediments during the Genesis flood. Last point, the problem of the great escarpments is better answered in the context of the Genesis flood. What are these big escarpments? They Around some of our major continents, we have what we call passive margins. This gets into the plate tectonics model. A passive margin is where the continents are sliding away from each other horizontally, or they're rifting, they're separating from each other. It is not where they're colliding like they do along the south coast of South America. Uh, these are called passive margins, and so on. And you look along those passive margins and you see very high cliffs inland. Right here, there's a map, some of these. Red lines represent these scarps or escarpments. These are very high cliffs. You've probably seen some of them not knowing exactly what they were. They're not formed by faults or anything like that. They're very high cliffs that you have here. Uh, Edge of South America, South Africa, very famous one there. Australia, so coast of India, uh, east, <coughs> west coast of India, uh, very high. These are inland. These scarps are commonly maybe one to four, three, one to three kilometers high. They're commonly 50 to 100 kilometers inland. How did they form? How do you, uh, this is the scarp problem. How do you form these things? Uh, you, you, uh, you have to erode this scarp uh, from, from the edge here to there. Uh, continents were assumed to be together, you know, and the layers were continuous across the continents. And so you've got, you've got to, Somehow you've got to erode these scarps, and you have to erode them horizontally. Uh, well, they're not false and so on. Uh, they're, they are obviously the result of erosion. How do you get horizontal erosion instead of vertical erosion when gravity pulls downward? Uh, here's a, uh, <coughs> shows you what happens when you erode a mountain. You, you can see all this uh, air, higher area here being eroded away, and you're just depositing this material here. 
How are you going to remove that material when you're eroding a scarp? Uh, two main models. One, erosion was vertical. You just erode that part down. 100 miles, and all of a sudden you got this scarp here. Uh, I shouldn't say 100 miles, 100 kilometers. Uh, scarp, a kilometer or two high. How's that possible? Uh, some say, well, you just erode it down. Others say, no, you just, uh, just erode it uh, horizontally. Just keep eating, chipping away at that scarp. Here, here are the two models we're talking about here. The left here, the green arrow, you can see the vertical scarp is chipped away. Vertical scarp, you just chip down the whole thing. But you don't chip where the scarp is. So why would, why would erosion just stop where the carp is, scarp is? Well, the, the, the flood model explains this very easily as the receding waters of the flood. We had this flood, and waters receded uh, during the last half of the flood, and they washed out these things. Horizontal water flowing off was able to clean out these flat areas between the continents. A uh, comment about this in Drakensberg, Drakensberg Scar. That's the one in uh, South Africa. <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, Scar retreat. This was the standard interpretation. Well, it just, we just had horizontal erosion. Scar retreated. Uh, the, the, the model of the arrow we showed you at the left and the last diagram and so on. Uh, they'd have to retreat at the rate of 1,007 meters per million years. Folks, that is 27 times as fast as vertical erosion without the help of gravity. Erosion tends to be down, you know, because of gravity. Here you're going to erode this scarp 20 times as fast as normal vertical erosion according to that model. Now you need, you need some water here to clean this out, folks. And the receding waters of the flood would, would answer that very well. And, this is, and these major scarps, they're, they're over the world, you know. It's, uh, uh, so th there's a new model out now. And that is, uh, well, it, it's not possible to do it slowly. Let's do it rapidly. They're moving towards the flood model there, and I might say, and this, and they say, well, as the continents separated apart, there was a lot of rivers there and so on, they washed, and they washed these scarps out uh, for, you know, uh, 50, 100 kilometers uh, because of all this water from these rivers at that time. Uh, then now, now they're moving very slowly. Well, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, the, uh, here's a, we won't go into that aspect, it's just a criticism of the, of the whole system here. Uh, but uh, this is 206 pub, uh, publication. I know about seven papers in the science and geology literature that uh, adopt this particular model. Hey, no, it had to be fast at first. We can't explain it. Uh, by slow erosion, uh, slow horizontal erosion, it's, it's not very good. So, uh, just a model of the flood in part B there in the middle, you have water and the water escapes down. Uh, that would be the model that I would suggest for producing these scarps. There you have all the water you need, so to speak, of, to, to do this rapidly, horizontally flowing water to create these scarps. Uh, one last case, example of this, is the Grand Staircase, a little close to home here. This is just north of the Grand Canyon. <coughs> this is a scarp. Uh, notice the staircase, uh, pink cliffs above and so on, gray cliffs in the middle, white cliffs, uh, vermilion cliffs, and chocolate cliffs uh, below the Chenere and so on. This 
It's all cleaned out very nicely. How did it get cleaned out? Water flowed from left to right, sorry, from right to left, uh, going out the feeding waters of the flood. Uh, looking at uh, the picture from a diagram, this is a cross section of the Grand Canyon region. Uh, this is the right here, the Grand Staircase. You see it right here. Uh, this is uh, the great denudation postulated in the geology layer. You had to wash this all out because these layers are found, well, over here some. You find some of these layers in California, even so on, widespread layers. Uh, what washed this all out and left that grand staircase that you were looking at there with your various cliffs, that's your pink cliffs up here. Uh, so the, the uh, question is, how do you do this? Uh, and one geologist said, how fast would you have to erode it? Well, you just take the assumed time you have there and you can uh, figure out, you can do it. But, but by some experiment, they were able to get some dates and some lava flows. Uh, and uh, this reference here, the great denudation and so on. Uh, <coughs> I should say, so the, the reference is below, Schmidt. 1989, uh, he proposed that, well, that scarp moved horizontally, the grand staircase, at about six to seven kilometers per million years. Now, six to seven kilometers per million years, you know that. That's moving quite fast horizontally. Why didn't you go down? You don't, you don't erode vertically, you erode horizontally. This is, the, this is the problem with these scarps. And so on. And so, uh, but if you, that proposed is rate for the horizontal thing is 100 times faster than you'd expect vertical erosion. You need water to the flood to wash this out. This is, this is the, uh, this is a, a good model to explain this horizontal scarp retreat uh, that we have. So, uh, just explaining again what we have here. We, by, by the water of the flood flowing out as the continents separate, so on, they leave these scarps here because the flow was massive horizontal flow water uh, towards the oceans as the continents rose up after in the latter part of the flood. So conclusions. Uh, let's go over what we've mentioned. Many sedimentary layers are incredibly widespread in contrast to normal deposition patterns. Two, normal irregular topography could not accommodate deposition of most flat Paleozoic Mesozoic formations. Your topography is so flat, you have to lay flat layers on top of the other. Our topography is highly irregular. Current erosion rates would destroy our continents over 100 times in periodic times. Let's get into this rates of erosion thing. Positive erosion of periconformity challenges long geologic age. Yes. And lastly, passive margin discarpments are better explained by receding waters of the Genesis flood. So we, if you look out there, you can find significant data that supports uh, the biblical model. One does not have to give up his scientific integrity in order to believe the biblical account of beginnings. While the scientific literature overwhelmingly rejects that account, there is good data that supports it. Keep this in mind. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, this statement from Ellen White. God never asks us to believe by given sufficient evidence on which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason and this testimony is abundance. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration, 
you're not going to be overwhelmed with it. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. And I suggest to you that what we went over here gives you some evidence on which to rest your faith uh, regarding this contrast between the Bible, what most Christian churches believe in, and what uh, most scientists believe in. So, uh, keep believing the Bible. It's, it's a wonderful book. It tells us about a wonderful God. Uh, be, be grateful for that. Any questions? No questions. <laughs> we'll say we miss. Just a, a simple query. Dr. Rowe, thank you very much. You've been in this business for a long time. But how much of this data that you've presented this morning is included in your book? Uh, in general, most of, which, which book? <laughs> uh, yeah, which book? <laughs> I'm really grateful to the Lord for the books. I wrote uh, 118,000 copies of them out there. Uh, the first one covers most of this. Some of the G. Lai Collins stuff in the second one. But uh, the scarf thing, that's entirely new. I just... The scalp thing is new. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The, yeah, there's, the others are there to a certain extent, you know, but they, they evolve over time, if I can use a yes. scientific term. Thank you. <laughs> so, Dr. Roth, how do we understand these rapid depositions that we see these in the, using the biblical model. How did all these sediments end up on top of each other rapidly? What kind of a, you have to have a physical some. process can we well, envision? It, I've been trying to rack my brain. I cannot come up with anything, not that I'm a geologist. That's because so. you and I have neither, neither of us have seen the worldwide flood. Right. Uh, you had to have tremendous forces to spread those rock layers that, I'm sorry to tell you, they're there. It, it's not the, the forces, <clears throat> but the fact that you, you have a, a suspension of, of gravel and, and whatever material rapidly yeah. deposited, and mm -hmm. immediate, almost immediately, very shortly, another one and another one by the hundreds. What's going on? In, you know, in the, during the, after the flood. What's Worldwide flood. I know, but, but how, how is it, <laughs> take, I cannot physically envision a process that would bring stuff over yeah. in large amounts and deposit. Uh, Leonard has a comment. Will you go ahead? The, the evidence from the St. Helen, uh, when the St. Helena uh, mm. uh, volcano blew, the, mm. the mud flows that occurred mm -hmm. have, when the water broke through that mud dam, mm. it demonstrated layers that evidently had multiple mud flows. And you can see oh, yeah. in miniature, a miniature Grand Canyon with mm -hmm. all these layers, and that broke through literally in a 24 hours time down what was almost 30 feet of depth, making this new miniature Grand Canyon. And here are all these mud flows from this uh, St. Helen uh, volcano from all this water mm -hmm. and muddy water flowing. And you can see the different layers just, just in that very short period of time. Yeah, we have... Uh we have small examples of what might happen there to a certain extent. Uh, I might point out, uh, before Leonard talks, mm. <laughs> uh, there's a lot 
more data that I could give you about evidence for the flood on the local level. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it'd be a long list. Uh, but Leonard has done some very good work in that area, like the Coconino. And uh, I don't know how to explain that Coconino being so pure and so widespread and so flat. And it's flat on the bottom and flat on top. But wind doesn't usually leave things very flat. Leonard. Well, Ariel mentioned that we've never seen a worldwide flood. And I'd just like to expand a little bit on that. You're, you're saying you rack your brain trying to figure out how this, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time and energy. There, there's the fact that we've never seen a worldwide flood is, is far more significant than we would usually realize. A lot of things that happen geologically are not intuitive. You could not expect them just by thinking about it. Uh, we don't, some things we don't even recognize at all until we see something strange happen. Um, like there's a, there are a lot of deposits we call turbidites. Nobody envisioned that this could happen until uh, a part of a city over in Switzerland s slid into the lake. Uh, we have to see things before we can believe them. Um, when Mount St. Helens erupted, there were these huge mud flows that went, I don't know, 60 miles an hour down these canyons. Okay, down here you find stumps sitting upright. Okay, how could a stump tumble in this mud flow for 60 miles at 60 miles an hour and end up upright. Well, they do. A lot, like, a lot of things geologically, you just would not ever think of it unless we see it happen. They're not intuitive. And, and we have, the fact we've never seen a worldwide flood is a very significant issue. And um, only by research and, and seeing things out there will we understand. And we will probably never fully understand how this happened. And certainly not just by thinking about it. We'll never understand it. I, uh, I sympathize with your question to a certain extent. I look at that Chenarib, 100,000 square miles of that layer. Traditional interpretation is rivers, you know. Have you ever seen a river cover six states, depositing a unique layer only 100 feet thick? Come on, this doesn't fit at all. Yeah, no, no, I'll make another comment on that. Colleague and I are studying that the Moenkopi and the Shinarip sitting on top of it, and we're, we're, we've we've followed for a, oh, at least a hundred miles with a helicopter, photographing. That. That's the only way you can study this thing when it's on a cliff. Uh, Six thousand pictures, and we're putting all these together and uh, studying that in detail, that contact. And the the Moenkopi was mud; it was obviously soft, and this this very coarse conglomerate sitting on top of it. Uh, why didn't it just carve away all that mud? Well, it just didn't. There are, there are a few channels, but it's amazingly undisturbed. So how did this happen? It's, it's, it's got to be a process that we've never seen. How do you bring 100,000 square miles of, of sand and gravel without taking away this mud? There, there are many things that say that this was a... Um, a set of processes that, that we've never even begin to observe or comprehend. The Chenarib is there. I'm, I, I've seen it. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's there. Yeah. Just to add a little bit, I believe that uh, Mount St. Helen, what happened, uh, really gives us, the ones who believe in creation and flood, and flood um, really boost in our faith. Um, there's a microcosm of really what happened, uh, universal flood, what happened in Mount Selen, uh, St. Helen a few years back. Um, those, those trees that were floating upside down, you see, and they were standing in there. So well, in, the, in this geological column that we see the petrified um, uh, trees, how could those be through, they, did they live millions of years? Of course not. But what we see happened in some Mount St. Helen also gives us uh, the layers of uh, sediments that are going mm -hmm. one after another. And that we also see in the uh, geological column that we see these uh, petrified uh, uh, trees. Yeah. And I'm thankful that it happened. You know, I know several lives were lost, but it happened. Mm -hmm. yeah, that really gives us reason to believe. Yeah. 
I have, since I've been involved with thoughtful Adventist young people for a long time, uh, in discussing this, although I'm certainly not a geologist or paleontologist, it's still a very, very important and relevant uh, area of discussion with people who do believe in, in inspiration. And one of the most difficult questions to suggest an answer for is in a single definitional event, how do you have such distinctly different depositions mm -hmm. without yeah. starting and stopping? Uh, and that, that to me has been one of the really big challenges. One, a step in that direction uh, a few years ago uh, was uh, I borrowed from Leonard some as yet unpublished stuff on perhaps the, the flood being the most violent of a series of events that might have preceded it. Uh, who knows what, what it is, but still one of the, I believe, one of the biggest difficulties in explaining what's out there as a single event is the differences in layers. The, uh, Without it coming from different sources over well, large you, different no, areas. That, that's the answer right there. It came from different sources. That's why it's so... Yeah, but how do you do that with it simply getting fuller and fuller like water in a bathtub? Well, one comes from one place, one comes from another one for, for the next layer, and the next layer comes from a different source, uh, and so on. Uh, it's just different sources. Could I suggest something that surely tectonics have not just been horizontal but been vertical. So continents, whole tectonic plates have risen and subsided. And then the, the sources of the sediment can change as these subsidies have occurred. And the, so the direction of flow has changed from one place to another. I think the flood represents a whole series of different kinds of events in different parts of the planet. That's at least the way I've, I've found peace with this, this problem. Is, <laughs> yes. I, uh, I, I sympathize with your, your well, problem. What, one can find peace, but, but you, you know, very sincere, dedicated uh, believers in inspiration yeah don't always see it the same way and there's there, there's no single convincing argument a lot of those layers are not as pure as the uh, of course Coconino, boy, that's pretty pure I, I remember fondly one time ariel standing with you in a group at brisco on the edge of grand canyon and come to the conclusion that it wasn't there <laughs> because we couldn't explain it from any viewpoint. Well, uh, you... Uh, I, I'm not quoting you, incidentally. No, no problem. Go to my webpage. I have two discussions on the Grand Canyon. Uh, and I, uh, I admit it's there. <laughs> uh, I had to get that disclaimer in. <laughs> Uh, is weight of the layers involved in the horizontal structure? And was any of this um, up through the crust at the time of the flood, the water under coming up and then weight being involved in the layering horizontally? I, I'm not sure how to ask this, but. Uh, one interesting model that may fit what you're talking about is that uh, some of our pure, more pure sandstones, like the uh, Navajo and the Coconino, may have come from the fountains of the Great Deep, uh, which possess a lot of sand. And that's why they are notoriously free of fossils. They aren't totally free, but they are. It's hard to find fossils in those uh, layers, except for the tracks uh, Leonard worked on that would be after, after deposition. Uh, so you know, we don't know. Okay, let's face it. We don't have a good flood model, and. Uh, 
we shouldn't pretend that we do. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there are a number of possibilities there that uh, uh, can answer some of those questions, at least partially, like you were suggesting. Uh, they're there. Mm -hmm. You've got to face the fact they're there. And they, they certainly, the configuration certainly does not fit gradual development over, over long ages. Yeah. Let's see, get a microphone. Leonard's next, I guess. Oh, Leonard, oh, oh, well. Okay, we'll get to you, Leonard. Uh, they, they did a dating on the Mount St. Helens of and uh, the dating came back that uh, Mount St. Helens was over a million years old. Yes. Yeah, well, there, there are anomalous dates all over, and there are explanations for them. Keep that in mind. They do get a lot of dates that are old. Keep that in mind, too. And we need to explain those. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to comment on what approaches seem to be helpful <clears throat> we can we can look at these rocks and think okay how could i how could the flood be how could i fit this into the flood um when we do that like i was saying before we're dealing with things that are in geology and not intuitive we haven't seen it we probably would never understand it uh, but a, another approach that I've used, I've, I've been doing geology research, paleontology for several decades and publishing scientific literature, and what I find works is I, I start with, un, with the understanding of the Bible foundation of the flood, gives me a starting point. And if I accept that, my research is more successful. I'll notice things that I would probably never notice if I was wondering if this is real. Okay, good point. I think it's important for us to recognize that history cannot be studied the same way we can study experiments at, on a bench top where we could have the right controls and we could repeat it as often as we wish until we understand what actually happened. Um, that's not the way history works and particularly Mm, the geologic history <laughs> for which we have so little information of what actually happened. Um, we therefore need to understand that we cannot either exclude, as some people are wont to do, God from the picture simply because there is no evidence that he was there according to their thinking, or somehow assume that everything follows one particular script as per uh, my particular opinion. Um, reminds me of a verse in the Old Testament which, which Moses was admonishing the people of his day before he was about to depart. What the Lord has given to us and our children to know is ours to study what it he has not he has kept for himself you know perhaps one day we'll be able to review the record of these events but until we are we can't really argue about them in a way as if we have all the information that that's not realistic Wise comment, very wise comment. We, uh, but there's enough data there that we don't have to give up Absolutely. our faith. The first time I saw the Grand Canyon, I was 10 years old. And my mother, with the, my uh, other three siblings, drove us from Illinois out to California. We stopped and she said, we will not be joining any of the lecture groups. What you see is because of the flood. And I was 10, and I, I just took it in. I didn't understand anything about the colors. They were beautiful. Um, 
there was a, a tour bus of people from England, and I remember a lady <laughs> came up next to me and said, oh my, what a hole. And that was about <laughs> the extent of what, you know, <laughs> she went and got back on the bus. But, you know, it was a powerful thing my mother did for me at the age of 10. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I was, I was in public school until my junior year in academy and saw the pictures in the books and told my mom and she said, well, we don't believe that because that's not what the Bible teaches. And I must have had that kind of uh, trust in, in my mother and in my Sabbath school lessons and um, made it through to this day. But I, I will never forget that, that experience of um, what she said to me at that time. It was simple, she didn't understand as we've discussed this morning. We, we don't get it. We can ask Jesus when we see him. <laughs> but there is enough data out there that you can believe. Uh, enough scientific data. You, you, some of it's overwhelming. When uh, we were in Hawaii a couple of years ago on Maui, there was a certain point I would go walking in the morning and I would see waves coming in this way and I would see waves coming in this way and I, they were coming in whichever way. And so the water flow, who knows what's going on. And it also amazes me when I go to the beach, and this is very deep thought, <laughs> to see what water does in the sand when it goes around rocks or when it hits something else. And if we just took a picture of it, no one could understand why it does that. But for me, to see what water can do just at the beach alone tells me that, uh, like you said, there's enough evidence that this world was in a lot of turmoil once. Okay, you folks have a good Sabbath. Thank you.